Okay, here it goes. Avoiding the Lambda death loop. Today, I'm going to be reading my own blog post, one that I just published on my blog. Uh, and it's all about how a recent change in AWS Lambda can cause Lambda functions to not just time out once, but time out permanently and exist in this constant loop, failing and failing over and over and over again until you either fix it or eventually the Lambda sandbox times out and you get a new one. So let's talk about it. Let's jump in. I've been documenting this for a while. If you haven't seen this already, there have been a number of changes to the Lambda sandbox environment. A lot of them we don't see and we, we shouldn't see, but a couple of them I've pointed out before, like for example, the fact that there is a new IP address for the Lambda runtime API. Uh, previously, it ran on localhost on port 9001. And then after that, around August 13th, depending on which region you're in, it went to a link local address at 169.254.100.1. So it's clear that they're changing something, something that underpins Lambda entirely. And what I think is happening is they're starting to like rebuild some components of the sandbox. And I think this is also part of it. So I, I noticed this, I got a couple of reports that functions were timing out and reinitializing. And as I started to dig in, I realized that there were some issues. To, to paint the picture for you, you have to understand that not all cold starts in Lambda are identical. There's a cold start you get when you deploy new code. And then there's the cold start that you can get when your function crashes or runs out of memory or times out, and then it has to reinitialize your function. In that case, it's called a suppressed initialization. Now, this has always existed, and this has been something that's been part of Lambda forever because Lambda, Lambda functions uh, contain arbitrary code. If you crash that running node process, it has to restart it for the next invocation, so it can do that. And when it does, it happens during the invoke cycle of your Lambda function. It's no longer in the init phase that happened at the very beginning. Now you're in the invoke phase. So when when that happens, this can this issue can occur. So previously, Lambda functions allowed up to 10 seconds to initialize. And for most runtimes, that's completely free. The only time that you'd be charged for that is if you're running a custom runtime or a container-based runtime. But in those cases, the whole idea is like you get this time to warm up your function. It's free because like it's sort of a consequence of how AWS Lambda is designed. Uh, but you get 10 seconds for your function to warm up. And I used that information to figure out how Lambda was pre-warming your functions in the proactive initialization post, which I can link to below. But we use that information to figure this part out. It's important to note that historically, this 10 second in iteration was evaluated separately from the configured function timeout. So if you had a function timeout, say it's like five seconds, you would get 10 seconds for it to initialize and then plus five seconds for that invocation to run. Now today, this change, you still get the first 10 seconds on the very first initialization of a sandbox. Brand new sandbox comes along, or maybe you just deployed code, you get 10 seconds to initialize, and then after that, you have up to your timeout for every invocation, that's totally fine. The problem, and here's the problem, is what happens when your function uh, has something go wrong with it? What if it crashes? And let's look at this example to learn more. The Lambda timeout doom loop is something that really just happens when you have a function that has maybe a longer cold start time, but you've configured it to have a very short timeout, especially something like three or five seconds. So consider a function with a three second timeout. So if you haven't seen it, here is what the invocation looks like the very first time it has to initialize. Lambda will pull your source code down. It will start the runtime, maybe it's Node or Python or Java or .NET. And then it will run the static initialization and the pre-handler initialization code. This is the code that lives outside of your handler. Logically, it lives like above your handler, things like importing dependencies or maybe connecting to a cache or a database client. All of that can kind of happen in that initialization phase. And then after that, let's say you have an invoke phase that runs. And that's pretty typical. So in this example, it's about a three second initialization and then a one second uh, invocation time. And let's just take that as an example here. Okay, but let's say something comes along and you have another invocation. Maybe it is the second one, or maybe it's just a next invocation, which runs all the way to a timeout. It runs for a full three seconds. So at that point, Lambda kills your sandbox. It kills that node process or that Python process, and that invocation is dead. Now, this is the wrinkle. This is the suppressed initialization. Your code takes three seconds to initialize, like we just talked about before. It takes three seconds to initialize, but your overall timeout is three seconds in total. Now the problem is you are in a doom loop. So your handler must reinitialize because it crashed. The entire node process crashed. It was killed uh, because your function timed out originally. Now it's in this doom loop. Now, no matter what happens, because your function takes three seconds to initialize and you set a three second timeout, it may not make it to that invoke phase. It's just going to roll over and over and over again in this death loop until you either uh, fix the bug or extend the timeout, um, or you know it actually initializes because for some reason you know that connection is easy to make, or um, maybe loading that code finally works the second or third time. I'm not sure. 
but it, inevitably this is just going to be a loop until that completes and it can crash over and over again. And this is especially especially a problem if you have a very small function timeout for the invocation phase. I'll just open my editor and let's take a look at what this looks like. So I have a very simple CDK application. There's not a lot to it. It's just gonna deploy this Lambda handler. So we've got a method here that just causes a delay. In this case, it sets a timeout for whatever we pass it. And what we'll do is in the static initialization phase, this is time outside of the handler, right? Above the handler. This is gonna run when the function initializes. We're gonna use a top level await and wait for three seconds to simulate like a longer iteration. Again, maybe this could be creating a network connection. It could be connected to a cache. It could be pulling some secrets down or something. Uh, and then we'll log that the initialization finished. And then our actual handler, our actual serverless function, it's not gonna do much. It's just going to look and see what the query string parameters are. And if we pass the crash parameter, we'll uh, go ahead and wait five seconds. This will bring us to that timeout. Otherwise, it will just return 200 and say, okay, hello from Lambda. And here's the idea. We're going to initialize, and that very first time, remember, we get 10 seconds, so this three-second initialization will be totally fine. And then we'll run the normal handler, no problem. And then on the second invocation, we'll pass the crash parameter, and the function will time out. It'll error. But then here's the difference. After that, even when we remove the crash parameter, even if we just send the regular URL, which again worked the first time, no problem, it'll never recover again. That sandbox is now broken permanently. Let's take a look at what this looks like. So we'll curl the endpoint. It's going to take three seconds to warm up, more or less, and then it'll say hello from Lambda. If we hit it again, totally fine. Hello from Lambda. The sandbox is working. Everything is fine. No problems here. But let's crash it. So now it's going to run past that three second timeout into this crash. And now there's an internal server error. But now let's go back. Let's just use the regular endpoint, which we just saw worked just fine, no problems. Now, no matter what we do here, the sandbox is broken. It cannot be recovered. It is just going to permanently, indefinitely loop forever until we either redeploy it or you know, change an environment variable or force a cold start, or we actually fix the code. Uh, this is the Lambda Doom Loop. This is what I'm trying to convince all of you that you should avoid. And let's talk about exactly what you can do to avoid it. So I actually worked with the AWS team on documenting some of these steps to avoid this Doom Loop. The first thing, and this is the simplest thing, just increase the timeout. If you know your function takes a while to initialize and you know you have a short timeout, you can fall into this trap. And the fastest way to fix it is just extend that timeout. Make sure that your initialization time is covered under your invocation time. So Figure out how long your function takes to initialize typically, that'll be locked in the initialization locks, and then add to it about the longest you think a normal request or invocation would take, and then just set that as your configured timeout. That's super important to do here because like I showed earlier, if you don't have this, your function can get into this infinite loop and crash forever. If you still have some headroom, if your function initialization is mostly interpreting code, right? You have just a lot of code you have to load. You're not necessarily waiting for IO, for like a network connection or TLS negotiation to occur you can increase the configured memory to get more CPU. At 1,769 megabytes, you're gonna get a full vCPU equivalent in your Lambda function. And that's about the fastest anything is gonna initialize in the Node and Python and Java and kind of .NET world. I don't think any of those runtimes take advantage of additional cores to do static initialization or you know pre-interpretation. So I think right about there is probably the sweet spot. Now, if you've done that already and you're still maybe having some issues or you're worried about it, it's time to actually take a hard look at your function initialization. I gave a whole talk on this at reInvent 2023. That's how I kind of became known as the king of cold starts or whatever I get quoted as. So you, you can take a look. There's a lot of tips in there. I've also written another blog post here about lazy loading, and I'll add a link in the description below. Finally, you also should consider modifying your function code so that things like a timeout don't cause your environment to error and then fall into this loop. You can do that by not crashing the node process, which is basically what I'm doing by running all the way to a timeout. If you want to avoid that in your own code, you can actually race the deadline by using the provided get remaining time in milliseconds method. It's on the context object. So you can sort of set like a promise uh, timeout and a promise.race between your code and that code. And then you can actually just return like a timeout error without actually crashing the process. And that'll prevent that from happening. These are now all in the docs as well. So I'm really glad that AWS was able to get these out. Uh, it covers all of these different cases that they, you can use to avoid this problem. I'll also leave a link to this below, but it's important to know that there are strategies for this. I just don't want this to take you or anyone else by surprise. And I know that a bunch of you won't read the blog post, but you will watch a YouTube video.
I hope you liked it. If you did, please hit the like button and subscribe. If you didn't, leave me a comment. Let me know what I got wrong. Thanks a lot. See you in the next one. Good luck.